welcome to Integrated. This is the podcast where we seek to bridge the gap between the intellect and the will so that we can grow as disciples of Christ, surrendering all that we are and all that we have to the truth. Hi, Jenny. Thank you so much for coming on to Integrated today to, to talk more about uh, your new book. The last time you were on, you hadn't written a book yet, and now you do have a book called Don't Plant Your Seeds Among Thorns, A Catholic's Guide to Recognizing and Healing from Domestic Abuse. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about this book today, so thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. And I was really honored to actually write an endorsement for this book. I It's the first one I've ever written. <laughs> and I have to say, your your writing style is very good. Um, have you always been a writer? I have, yeah. And and I just wanted to put a plug in for my publisher, um, On Root Books and Media. The publisher was excellent. My editor there was, I was just, I'm really honored to be have been published by them. So they're a great company. But yeah, I mean, I, I always, my mom makes a joke that I was born with a pen in my hand. I don't think I really was. That would have been painful for her. But, um, <laughs> but yes, I've always, I've always uh, wanted to write and always been a writer. And, you know, I've, I have my, my Substack blog and have been you know, freelancing in with various Catholic publications for years. Um, I actually have, you know, several novels that I've written and then never did anything with. Um, so this is the first published book. Wow. Wow. That's so interesting. And God, so this, it's just amazing. Cause he gave you this gift obviously and this desire and you're able to, to direct it towards something that I think will benefit so many people. And, you know, for anyone who's listening and maybe isn't familiar with Jenny's story, uh, I'll, I'll link a, in the, in the description, uh, the previous interview that we did on domestic violence because there's a, so much confusion in the Catholic church about um, domestic violence and marriage and how we navigate uh, those, those really awful, sad situations that women and men sometimes find themselves in where they get married and they realize that their spouse is abusive. Um, and, and we're as Catholics, we're, we're not, we don't believe in divorce, things like that. And so um, I think people can often feel very stuck in this abuse cycle. So maybe just like a quick recap, what is the basic, um, what was, I guess, before we get into the recap, what was your goal with the, with writing this book? The goal really, well, it was like the subtitle says, helping people to recognize, to know what abuse is and what abuse isn't. And if they are in that situation, well, what does the church teach? Because that's that's so important to really know what the church teaches, because quite often, unfortunately, a lot of priests aren't educated in learning about the red flags of abuse. So a woman comes to them and, you know, they'll get advice that is just more damaging or, you know, they don't realize they that they think, OK, marriage is a sacrament. So like you said, I'm stuck in it. They don't realize that the church teaches. No, if you're in a situation that is dangerous to you and dangerous doesn't have to be physical. It can be, you know, an emotional, um, psychological, then it's okay to leave. Now that's in the code of canon law. So just really helping my, the, my audience is Catholic women. So it's helping Catholic women really recognizing, um, healing and knowing what the church teaches so that they can be completely clear. Yeah. Like I said, there's just so much confusion and it's, it's, it's so interesting that you say that sometimes priests, you know, they're not generally well formed in this area. And maybe this is an area that the church really could use some help in because I don't know about you, but it seems like the word abuse is thrown around a lot these days. Do you think, especially narcissistic abuse, do you hmm. think that it is more prevalent today? Or do you think that there's more of an awareness of of what is abusive or less tolerance for what's abusive? Like, what are your thoughts on the, this phenomenon that we're seeing? I, I personally think that we're seeing, it just seems as if this is more of a conversation than it has been in the past. And I, I wonder why. People are talking about it more now and recognizing that abuse is not just physical. You know, that there is that emotional level, that psychological level, that spiritual abuse, you know, it, it, that's so, so painful. So just a more awareness of what it is, more support, I think, and just more of a willingness. It's not like so 
it's almost like, I won't say that it was taboo to talk about it, but it just wasn't something that you really talked about. Um, and now we're just, because a lot of people are just seeking healing from it. They just need to heal. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there's a lot to be said about that. And, and part of it maybe perhaps is we're not living so much day to day for just mere survival. <laughs> we're not as impoverished as we've been in the past, things like that. And so now we can sort of address those higher level things that maybe cultures historically have not been able to address. I'm not sure, but that's, it's, it's worth pondering. Um, and I think too, we have to be really clear on what is abuse. I mean, the, the actual definition is like the misuse of something or someone is, is to abuse it. Um, so maybe it would be helpful for people to see what is abuse? Like, what does it look like and what, what isn't, or what doesn't constitute abuse? Because there can be some confusion there too. Uh, yeah, I think that's really, really important because when you're in a marriage, you're going to get in an argument. You're going to get upset. You're going to say things that you don't mean. You're going to say things that are unkind. You're going to do things that are unkind. That's going to happen. And that is called being a human being in this right. fallen world. That is not being abuse. It can be abusive behavior, sure. I mean, our, we're all prone to that. We're human. We will say things that we don't mean. We will get upset with our spouse. Again, that's just called a human marriage. Um, so it's really important to realize, okay, I just had a a fight with my spouse does that mean he's abusive or maybe I am or you know no um, abuse is a pervasive pattern that increases it generally increases over time this is a pattern and so that really has to be understood that this is a repetitive thing so a lot of times in an abusive relationship like you will have a lot of resentment a lot of there's gaslighting like in a normal relationship there isn't purposeful get there might be like again slip up like the, the, the occasional I'm sorry you feel that way <laughs> yes of, you know what I mean that's subversive yeah. but really it's just not well thought out you know right. yeah yeah but not making but in an abusive relationship there's no making true amends they might be like because so in the book I discussed the abuse cycle and I believe we discussed this last time as well yes where there is a pattern so there's you know an abusive incident and then there's that, oh, I'm sorry, but, you know, you get, you always get that, I'm sorry, but you trigger me, I'm sorry, but, you know, and so it's during like that honeymoon phase there, they um, will try to make up and then tension building and another, another abusive incident and just goes and goes like you're on a wheel. It's like, oh, you get confused and it just, it, and the behavior is, well, it can be covert or it can be like over the top, like really obvious, but then it also can be really covert. So it's confusing when you get into that psychological manipulation. Um, but again, it's important to remember, it's not a one-off or just another, an argument. And then you make amends and you actually talk about it. In a healthy relationship, you can talk, you can go to your spouse and say, Hey, you really hurt me. When you said X, Y, Z, you hurt me. And can we talk about this? And you get in response, yeah, we can. Not another being attacked again. Right. Right. And and that those are some of the key distinctions. I mean, I always, yeah, we have to look. Is there a pattern of behavior that is destructive and belittling, degrading, demeaning, um, or or just, yeah, the gaslighting that is so pervasive that you start to question your own sense of reality, like, in everything, um, <laughs> you know, because, it, because then it, it seeps into every as every relationship that you have where you leave, you leave a conversation with someone and all of a sudden you're going, Oh, I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe they, they took it this way and you feel guilty or, or something happens. You're like, I'm maybe I am the crazy one. Maybe my initial response was, this was really cruel, but then you walk away and you think, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm overreacting. I mean, it's, it's so pervasive when, when you get into the psychological component, because it does influence and impact every other relationship in your life. Um, and it's so much more hurtful when it's coming from your spouse. So i um, really glad that you were able to, to share that and cl clarify that for a lot of people, because I don't want anyone to listen to this interview and then they get into an argument with their spouse and they're like, 
you're abusive <laughs> um when when that's not norm the normal uh behavior for them so very good um one other thing have, oh go ahead if I, i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but one other thing that's really important to recognize too is in an abusive relationship you like lose yourself it's that it's that progressive loss of self lo like you said you're confused all the time you're you're all you feel um just on overdrive, even when you're not, or, you know, fight, fight, or flee, freeze, one or, one or the other. Um, so or the, fawning. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. or fawning. Yeah. So the relationship doesn't enrich your soul. Like a healthy relationship is about mutual self-giving and helping your spouse reach heaven. And in an abusive relationship, you feel the opposite. You're, you always feel like you're being dragged down or giving, giving, giving and not receiving, you know, so it's like a constant, there's no, you know, there might be times of being like, oh, okay, I feel good again because of the cycle. But in general, if you look at the relationship overall, it's not, it's not helping you to become a more holy person, which is right. the purpose of marriage. It's, it's actually kind of like destroying your sense of self. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is what the abuser kind of wants in a, in a mm -hmm. sense, whether you know, consciously or subconsciously. So what, how do, how do people then evaluate whether or not they're in an abusive relationship or an abusive marriage? I mean, you're looking for patterns of behavior and you're, you're, you sort of maybe get familiar with the, with the cycle, but like, is there a way to, for couples or, or women to really dive deep and evaluate, um, whether or not they are like the practical pragmatic look at, a relationship when you're when your emotions are tied into it so much it's I could see it being really hard to clearly evaluate that that's why like in the book I mention a lot of the red flags a lot of the things that to look out for um, especially when it comes to covert abuse which can be really confusing in my experience um, people don't even seek out books like mine or or writing like I do in my sub stack until they already are so so the, the cycle has been going on for so long that they can no longer like you don't want to admit that you're in an abusive relationship you don't want to pick up a book that's about abuse you just want to be like okay i can fix this i can fix my marriage i can so it usually it's like they are at a point where they're like no there really is something wrong this can't be normal and i have to find out what normal is and what it isn't. So, and, and that's why in the book, we mentioned the red flags and we mentioned like what, what marriage is, what right. is supposed to be. So we talked about gaslighting a little bit. What are some of the other red flags that people might, um, might, might see in their relationship that maybe should make them pause and evaluate? Well, abuse is all about power and control. So it's like controlling that other person. Um, so if you find yourself isolated, like maybe if your spouse, um, says things about your family, well, if outright, okay, so the more, more overt, no, you can't go visit your sister or your mother or your, no, you have to just be here or your friends, um, to the more covert of like, okay, yeah, you can go, you know, visit your friends, but then when you get back, there's an incident and you, and then you, when you start recognizing that pattern, you get to the point where you're like, I'm not even going to go out to see my mom, my sister, my mm. whatever, because it, it's not worth the repercussions or it might be like subtle digs. Like, yeah, you know, you know, your, your parents are crazy. You know that, don't you? Or, Hey, you know that your friend is talking about you behind your back. Right. You yes, know that. that manipulation, that right. manipulation that caught that drives a wedge between uh, you and your your other relationships. Yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah. Um, are, are there any other like red flags? Uh, that was a great example of the over the overt and the covert. What are there any other red flags? I mean, besides the obvious of they're hitting you um, or yeah, just violating your dignity in, in like a very obvious way. There are a lot, probably too many to, you know, talk about here, Thank but you, you know, um, so try, you get in a conversation and you just try to express your opinion and that ends up being this big, 
either a big fight that is like explosive fight or, you know, again, on the more covert side, you get just the cold shoulder or you know, you're not allowed to have an opinion other than the abusers. Mm hmm. Um, and if you express it, it's not like a conversation. Like if I said to you, Angela, Hey, you know, I don't agree with you about this topic. Oh, and then we could have like a really interesting, lively debate about it. And at the end of the conversation, you know, maybe I under, I understand where you're coming from and maybe I end up agreeing with you or maybe I don't either way. It's okay. Right. That's right. a healthy, relationship. we don't have to agree in an abusive relationship. It's like, no, you have to agree. And so you get, if you don't agree, you get forced into it by like a word salad, which is like just this jumble of like, you get so confused with what is this person actually saying? You try to defend yourself and you can't, you're so confused at the end. You just said like, okay, fine. I agree. Mm. And that's like, mm -hmm. like, you can't have your own opinion. So again, that loss of self, when you right. can't have your own opinion, you can't go out and visit friends. It's that loss of self. So that's another really good example um of something to look out for and and uh, another one i've noticed is like financial abuse of of one spouse not um not supporting their their other spouse or withholding funds from them so that the usually the woman has to go to her husband and ask for money just to pay the bills or get groceries or things i'm not talking about you know, extravagant purchases here, but things that would help with the family, just basic, um, um, purchases. So, you know, those are, those are other things that I think sometimes in certain groups where, where this role of male headship is sort of, um, blown out of proportion where the man is no longer serving his family, but he's controlling his family. Um, I, I, and I think that there is sort of a movement towards that right now in the church, which I'm, I'm pretty concerned about. I don't know if you've noticed sort of the same, um, trend going on here, but it is sort of tied to so many of these, um, scripture verses that are misused, uh, to sort of advantage certain, certain families or certain men where they're, they're misrepresenting what Christ is saying or, or uh, the apostle. So I loved that you included a section on that in your book. Uh, would you mind maybe talking about a couple of, of Bible verses that are, are misconstrued and taken out of context to subjugate spouses? Because that, that is a really nefarious form of abuse, in my opinion. Yeah, it is. The, the spiritual abuse is so common and it's evil. You know, you take sacred scripture, the words of the Holy Spirit, this is the word of God, and you just twist it to your own means is just so of course you know when you think of um, submission subjugation the first one that comes to mind is ephesians 5 22 wives must be submissive to their husbands so in the book I, I i have a whole chapter on abused bible verses but i spend the most time there because it's so important because it, that is what like it's used in isolation just that one verse you know so an abuser won't mention that 521 says mutual submission and then the rest of it is about really the, the, the biggest emphasis is on the husband loving the wife, which we have to remember in historical context, that's like radical. Like yeah. The Romans didn't, the, a, a wife was just one little step above a servant. So what St. Paul was doing was like revolutionary. And that's actually why there's always been more women in the church than there have been yes. men because it, Christianity, Catholicism was the first world, the first religion that gave women prominence and protection that, that, that spoke up for the dignity of women. I, I think that gets overlooked a lot. It does. It was known as a woman's religion. Like the Romans would kind of would mock the Christians um, because it was known as a woman's religion, but that is why they, they, and, and understand, well, there's a lot in St. Paul that we can, we could, dive into as far as that's concerned but you know with with Ephesians 5:22 and understanding what submission is I know when I read it correctly I'm like yeah I want to be submissive to my husband because what is that what does the word mean sub under mission under the mission of my husband okay what's the mission of my husband well Paul tell, tells us that is to love the wife as Christ loves the church Christ gave his life for the church that's 
pretty heavy. The mission of the husband is to love his wife that much, to, to sanctify her and to make her holy, just as we wives are to make our husbands. So the purpose of marriage is to help our spouse reach heaven. So that mission of my husband's to love me and help me reach heaven, sure, that sounds good to me. You know, and that's what really Paul is saying. It's about that mutual self-giving and, and love. It's not about power over control. He was not talking about, oh, you have to be submissive. Do everything your husband says. doesn't matter what it is. Um, that's not what he was talking about. Right. Yeah. And, and, and two, I think um, it's easy for women who are in these situations to think, well, this is what Ephesians 5, 22 says. So I guess this is just my lot in life. And I don't deserve, often the, the language is, I don't deserve more than this. You know, mm -hmm. I don't deserve, uh, and, and especially if they come up from a background where they themselves were abused. And, and maybe that's an important thing too, is that um, we're more susceptible to marital abuse if we grew up in an environment where we were abused as children, mm -hmm. because that's, that abuse is what our nervous system is familiar with. And so we tend to seek out those types of relationships because that's what we know. We don't always mm -hmm. know what a healthy relationship looks like. I'm not saying that's always the case, but it seems to me like there's more, that is more common. Um, would you agree with that? Definitely. You know, and there's two things that come into play. First, it's like, it's, that's a normal relationship to them. That's what they see right. mirrored. Don't know any different. Also, that is love. To them, it feels like love. So even unconsciously, they're going to seek out a similar relationship because it feels like love. Mm -hmm. That's all they've known. And that's so important because a lot of people are like, well, why didn't she just leave? Why didn't she just leave when he was doing that? It's like, because that's literally all she's ever known. That's what her brain is wired towards. Um, and, and often because she's, she's terrified, you know, it's like, like, what would you, what do you say to people who say that to, to women or men? Because there, I mean, I think there's more men being abused today than there have been in the past as well. Um, and, and so like, what, what do you say to people who are like, well, why didn't they just leave? I try to educate people on on how hurtful that is. It's really important. And that's why, like, the book, I encourage not just survivors, but people. Like, I, I have a lot of priests reading it now, a lot of lay ministers. I'm like, thank you, God, because that is a blessing. You know, just that educating them on what it is and the proper way to handle it. So saying, oh, why don't you just leave is it's very it's hurtful. Because the self-esteem of someone being abused is already shot. So that just is like, you're right, I'm so stupid. Why don't I just leave? Or, you know, you guilty feelings. Or there's just so much that can come up. And there's so many reasons why a woman or a man doesn't or cannot leave. So going back to, like, the financial abuse, if that's in play, a lot of times financially it's like, how? You know, you just, so, and just understanding, too, that, People in abusive relationships, they don't, I have never met one so far who wanted a divorce. They want change. They don't want to be abused, but they don't want a divorce. Right. So it's that constant hope of like, oh, what if, what if sometimes we'll keep them in that situation? So there's just, there's just so much at, at play. And then also I, Educating people to understand that when a woman does leave, um, that's the most dangerous time physically. So there has to be a safety plan in place. So you can't just right. say once you just then, okay, I'll just leave right now. Well, no, you have to make plans. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and I wish, I wish more people knew that because um, you're exactly right. That is when the most women get killed in, in domestic violence situations. Um, and it's just so sad. It's really devastating. I, I did want to also make this point talking about how sacred scripture is often twisted uh, uh, to serve the abuser's needs, so to speak. Um, it was so interesting. I don't know if you've heard of Nancy Piercy, but she she's kind of like this sociologist. She's so interesting because she used to be this hardcore feminist 
and uh, she had a big conversion. She's she's some denomination of Christian. She's not Catholic, but in her work as a sociologist, she started looking into what is masculinity and femininity? What's going on in the culture right now? And she wrote this book called the The Toxic War on Masculinity. And she discusses in, in some of her interviews that um, the best marriages are are actually, well, couples who are Christian and serving one another in a Christ-like manner. And the worst marriages are not what most people would expect. They're not marriages between atheists, for example. Atheists or, or non-religious actually tend to have better marriages than another subset, which is uh, couples wherein the husband uses scripture to uh, subordinate his spouse. And those women report the lowest satisfaction in their marriages, even less than those who are pagans, um, atheists, things like that, which I just thought was so interesting and enlightening. Have you heard of her or her work at all? I haven't, but now I'm really excited to look into it. It sounds great. And and she's right, though. And, and this is what I see, you know, with my clients, those who... Uh, are experiencing spiritual abuse it's so hard because they just they love their faith and they are trying so hard just to be good you know to be the good loving spouse and then when they're told they're not and it's scripture that's saying it so another abused verse that i discuss in the book is you know you forgive 70 times seven jesus says forgive over and over right so the and an abuser will say well, you have to forgive me for this latest incident because jesus says so and it's like, right. that is like completely not an understanding. That is using forgiveness as in forgive and forget. Right. As if that's a real thing. And that's not what forgiveness is. You can forget, yeah. you can forgive someone, but you don't tolerate the behavior. Exactly. Just, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the expectation of the abuser is that you do just sort of you just accept it. You, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you, accept, this is how, this is who I am. You could, if you don't love me at my worst, you will never love me at my best. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. <laughs> oh. If anyone wants to buy this book or thinks maybe they know someone who would benefit from this, because I would imagine it'd be hard if you're in an abusive marriage to have this book laying out, you probably want it. I mean, it's sad, but I know of women who are hiding journal and journals uh, that they have, you know, um, because I know that's, a, that's a tip that you have, for example, that if you are, think you might be experiencing abuse, uh, maybe write about an, the incident after, as soon as you can, so that it's fresh in your memory. And the next time you start to wonder, well, am I crazy? Or maybe it didn't happen that way. Um, you can go back and, and kind of read through all of your stuff, but a lot of that stuff has to be hidden out of sight. So as not to, um, cause more issues with with the abuser so this book i feel like is kind of one of those things where um if you're in an abusive marriage you almost would have to hide it out of sight so that the spouse doesn't find it do you do you find that that's maybe the case a little bit or or do you think having an open communication dialogue is is like what has to happen um in that situation Obviously, it depends on the on the everyone has a different situation, but usually, if someone is actively being an unrepentant abuser, they're not going to listen to reason. They're not. You're not going to sit down and say, "Look, I, you're abusing me, and we need to resolve this." They're just going to be like, "No, you're abusing me," or um, something like that. So it's not. It it will do more harm than good to try to confront them unless their hearts are open. But if their hearts are still hardened, there's nothing that that we can do. To change another person, um, and I have I've had people contact me and say, "Yeah, I, the book was great. I loved it. I've been hiding it under my bed, you know, because they have to sleep in separate rooms, for example, or you know, whatever the case may be." Yeah, that's heartbreaking. So, what does the church say then in those situations where where it's intolerable? Um, the, the, the abuser is totally unrepentant and refuses to acknowledge the, the pattern of behavior that they're engaged in. Um, what does the church say about marriage in those situations? Because that, that's where a lot of this confusion comes in. It does. Yeah. And I quote the code of Canon law 1153. And I also quote a document called when I call for help written by the U S bishops. 
So those are both really important documents to read. So Code of Canon Law states that if there is danger to one of the partners, and it specifies, this is really important, it specifies not just physical, it specifies emotional, that psychological danger, that it is okay to leave. Mm -hmm. You can leave. And the Catholic Church says, yes, leave. So when they say leave, do they mean like separation or do they mean pursue an annulment or is it kind of a both and either or like it's up to you to discern with your priest or bishop or how does that work? So leave in the code of canon law, they're really talking about you separate Mm -hmm. and um, yes, go to your priest and you might have to edge That's why I like go to the priest, bring my book to the priest and have him read it. So he understands abuse and what the dynamic is because Code of Canon Law 1154 says that the spouses should return to the marital home once the danger is passed. So a lot of times in covert abusive relationships, the abusive spouse will say, oh, I'm getting better. I'm going to therapy. I'm doing everything. And, you know, maybe a few months will pass. And, and a few months is a long time for someone in an abusive relationship. It seems like, oh, a few months, that must be. And for a real change to take place, it takes years, not months. But it'll look like everything is okay. So, okay, I guess I should return. You return and the abuse gets worse. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's really like understanding what authentic change is and then is it safe to return? And that takes, you know, a lot of discernment and the really listening to the Holy spirit within yourself because the Holy spirit will speak and will say, it's not, it is safe or it's not safe or, so the dynamic is, you know, different than just like a regular. So we really have to keep that in mind that it might not ever be safe. And most often it's not, it's because it's still part of the cycle. So in that instance, then if, if a divorce becomes necessary, yeah, the annulment process, and I cover that in the book as well. Um, it can be, that's for me, you know, I, I found, and I'm, I've am i been married twice, so my first marriage was annulled, and I found the annulment process really healing. It's it's long. It does it does take a while, but it was, it, it helped me to understand the dynamics of really what was going on even further. Just um, to process it. Yeah. Yeah. But then, then so the, and the church will acknowledge, okay, this marriage was not a sacrament from the beginning. That's what a declaration of marriage. So how do they, how do they determine that though? In in these situations, because sometimes, uh, I mean, I can I'm there's an instance I'm thinking of right now. You know, everything seemed great. Uh, husband is super traditional. Wife very loving. They have several kids together, and he becomes abusive after they they've been married for some time you know work it's really stressful and he starts to uh and he's got parents who are enablers and all of this stuff and so this poor woman with her five children he's extremely abusive um but he wasn't like that when they got married you know what i mean so in in that situation in that kind of a situation which i can't imagine she's the only one um she's been separated for quite some time is my understanding but um how would they declare that marriage null if maybe he wasn't like that when they got married? Cause I think that sometimes happens. It, you know, it's really looking at the underlying dynamics and abusers just don't, don't like just pop out of the woodwork. All, all of a sudden that you wake up one morning and be like, I think I'm going to be abusive to my spouse. You know, there's right. usually stuff underneath that those little subtle red flags that you don't realize, you know, maybe a little bit possessive or controlling or this, or the, like the, in the annulment process, if if the annulment advocate is trained in knowing these red flags, again, you and I, and I mentioned this in the book, there is a good chance you have to educate the annulment advocate or the people who are helping you with this because and so that's why educating yourself of like because a lot of times in those situations, once you educate yourself and you realize the red flags, you look oh look back and think. You know, I thought that was normal that he did X, Y, Z, but it really wasn't. And you can see, like, because abuse does get worse over time. So you can see how it might have built up without even realizing it. So usually in those situations, that's what's going on. It's not like it just happened all of a sudden, even though it seems like it. 
what happened is most likely what happened is he was co a covert abuser initially, which is really hard to detect. If you don't know what covert abuse is, you don't know the manipulation tactics, you don't know what a healthy relationship is like we discussed. Um, it's really hard to understand. And so again, abusers just don't wake up one morning and decide to be that way. This right. is something they have their own damage. They have something in their childhood. They, they, you know, were, so it was, these situations are going covert to overt. Mm -hmm. hmm. So the, yeah, that's might so important. Changed. it might've changed, but it was still there. Hmm. That's so interesting. Yeah. I suppose. I mean, when you're married, I mean, especially if you're doing things quote unquote the right way, you're not living with this person. You're not with them as often. <laughs> you might be talking to them. You're still more of that infatuated phase of life. And even early in the marriage, you still kind of often have that honeymoon phase. But but when you get to the day-to-day -day part of marriage where it require, requires grit and, and total self-gift where it's not, it doesn't feel good all the time. Um, that's kind of where the rubber hits the road, I think. And, and then you really get to know the character of the person that you are with, um, what kind of person they are when, uh, when life seems a little less exciting, for example, or um, that kind of a thing. So that's a really good point. And I, I also just really wanted to highlight that because, again, so often you hear people and I see it online all the time, for, for example, like, why didn't she just leave him? Why didn't he leave her? It's like, there's so much going on. And I think I just would love for there to be more compassion talking about um, survivors of abuse, not, you know, and then there's the other end of things, you know, you get the Me Too movement, which is this other phenomenon. And it has really denigrated the progress that we have made towards uh, talking about domestic violence and actual abuse. Um, do you find that like these sort of social movements have had a, a negative impact when trying to actually address abuse where uh, maybe it's not taken as seriously as it should be? Yeah, I mean, it, it's to accuse someone of being abusive just because you don't like them. That That is, it, it, it waters down the word. And like the word narcissist, I mean, I use that in, in my writing... I try not to as much as possible, but I mean, you have to because it's a word that people know, but I, I try more often than not say narcissistic traits, like yeah. toxic narcissistic trait rather than saying the narcissist, because that's a word that bugs me because that's a word that people throw around. Like, I don't like you. You're a narcissist. You yeah. know, or they'll analyze public figures. He must be a narcissist. She must be a narcissist. How do you know? You only know their personal persona that might look a bit you know, so it's just thrown around so much, almost like a synonym for, I don't like that person. And right. that really waters down, like, what what does it really mean to be in a relationship with someone who truly is has these super high narcissistic traits? Um, and it can it can cause a, a an actual true victim of abuse to doubt themselves even. You know, mm -hmm. if they hear too much and then analyze, whoa, you know, how it's being used in, in an offhand sort of way, um, it can minimize their own situation. Yes. Yep. So I'm so glad that you said that. Yes, that's exactly right. So let's say a woman, she, she buys your book, she realizes all this stuff. She starts the process of, of trying to, um, make progress towards healing her marriage, but her husband is, is, um, the unrepentant, or maybe he's not like, how often is it that you see that there are couples who are able to uh, move forward from this abuse and uh, maybe work on their marriage? Like, I, I just can't imagine that that's super common, but is it possible? It's not common at all. I have, it's very rare in my experience, very, um, but it is possible. We are all, we all are given a free will and we all can choose to heal, to go on that healing path with Christ to become a better person. Um, the problem with abusive personalities is because I'll use the word nar narcissistic again, but it's true. They have a lot of narcissistic traits, meaning everything is focused on them for their own needs, for their own. That's what 
the power and control is all about them, 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 what they need. And the opposite of narcissism is humility. And it takes a huge amount of humility to change, to be able to look at your spouse and say, I've been mistreating you. I've been manipulating you. I've been gaslighting you. I've been abusing you. And I would, I'm wrong and I need help. That takes to truly, truly mean that that takes a lot of humility. So that's why it's so rare, but I mean, God can do anything if we open our hearts to him. So that's the thing is like, we have to invite Christ into that healing journey. Um, the secular world will tell the women, oh, he, yeah, he's a narcissist, forget about it. He can't ever change. And in a lot of ways, I agree with that. If you're looking at, at it from a secular point of view, because it takes Christ-centered healing. Um, mm -hmm. Bishop Fulton Sheen wrote a book, Three to Get Married, where he discusses Christ in the marriage, how Christ has to be the center point. God has got to be in that marriage. Um, when when a spouse makes their partner, expects their partner to be God, in, order, in other words, to fulfill everything in their lives, um, that's where things go wrong because a human being can't do that. So we have to make God the center. Um, so in order to change that, it has to be centered upon Christ. And how, how long, so you, you kind of mentioned, I mean, it can take, it's, months seems like a long time, but it's not really, this is a process that takes years. And so you really have to claw at uh, that healing in a way. I mean, you just are constantly striving every single day because you're, you're rewiring both both people are rewiring their brains entirely. Um, one to, but at the at the root, it would seem to me, and I'd love for you to, if as much as you want to share about your situation or not, um, but it would seem to me that the root of it is is accepting that God loves you, and and does that resonate with with you? Because I feel like both people have to come to that place where they start to receive God's love. Um, and I would love for you to talk more about that. Yeah, that's it, absolutely true. Again, that Christ-centered healing and realize, realizing how much God, how, how beloved we are by Christ. And going to the, like the Song of Songs and reading it as like our soul, our beloved bridegroom is singing that song to us. And he sings how lovely you are, how beloved, without a blemish. That's how he sees like our true inner selves. And it's really understanding that. And I know in my own, and I think anyone who's watched our previous interview, I had mentioned how um, I, my husband and I had been on that journey of healing. And now I can't even remember how long ago that interview was, but it was years, you know, so fast forward some years and that's what it takes. The healing, it's, we're still on a healing journey. We always will be in this life, but it, I don't even know how it would, it, yeah, I don't know how to get into it. it is a, it's a journey through Christ. And yes, just yesterday, I, cause it still kind of blows my mind. Like how can someone who treated their spouse in, in certain ways, all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, it took years and years of a lot of hard work on both our parts, but how can they have such a different perspective? How can they actually be a healthy spouse again? And I actually asked him what, after so long, what caused the scales to be removed from your eyes? You know, going back to a St. Paul quote from when he was on the road to Damascus, what, what was it? And he said, because he could know through his healing journey, Christ-centered healing journey, he said, there's no more denying how much God loves me. That knowledge went from his head. He knew that, but it went from his head into his heart. And that was his wound, like not feeling loved, his attachment wounds from childhood, you know, not feeling loved, then realizing in his heart the depth of how much God cherishes him, loves him. And he said in, now you're going to make me cry. <laughs> he said in, in realizing how much God loves him, that enabled him to realize how much I love him. Before he was just resenting me and yeah. not, because when you're treating someone like that, that's not, you can't even, you're hardening your heart to even feeling their love. But he said, once I realized that God truly loves me, I realized you truly love me and everything else just washed away. Mm. Everything washed away. 
And he said, that's what's happening right now. It's finally, finally happening. And, and he admitted, he said, I just have to keep myself in check. You know, his coach is, has told him, check in with yourself every day. And he says, and I do that. But he's like, it just washed away as if all those other things didn't matter, meaning all these other reasons why he felt he had to control me. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have to anymore. They, they just went because, because Christ, he, because he allowed his heart to be softened enough to let mm-hmm. Christ in there. And to let that healing begin. And with that, that humility and that knowledge and that patience of having to do that by himself. Because that healing he had to do by himself instead of looking to me to do it. Because we were separated and I can't heal him. Right. So doing that work on his own, separate from me, that's what helped him to really open his heart and to come to these in, in true humility, come to these conclusions. Wow. Understanding. Well, that's the thing too, is uh, it's not your job to heal him. That was, that was never your job. That was never for you to do. That was always the work of Christ. And he's the only one who could do it. He's God is the only one big enough for these really co- deep seated core wounds that we have. And, and the way that these wounds play out is different from person to person. And that's not to say that we can excuse abusive behavior. Like you said before, we don't tolerate abusive behavior, but we do have to recognize that um, these wounds that, that abusers have, cause they have them. I mean, people aren't just born abusive. Um, there's something that has gone on in their life that has cut them off emotionally to where they lack empathy. Um, you know, you get some of these other traits that we would describe as narcissistic, for example. Um, and that doesn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, you look at a child and they're not like, yes, children are somewhat narcissistic (laughs) because they're children and they are kind of entitled to things. You know what I mean? Um, but that, that inability to mature, especially as that frontal lobe develops, I mean, there's something going on there. And so, um, to pursue that healing on both ends is just so incredible to me. And to hear your husband speak in such a profound way about finally receiving the love of, of our Lord and being able to see that in you, like that is, um, that's transformative. That's, that's the gospel right there. I mean, that, that's a redemption story and it doesn't happen overnight. It's brutal. You know, it's not, and not everyone has a St. Paul moment, but it's not as maybe immediate as St. Paul, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> but I'm like, man, if there's, if there's a guy who was out murdering Christians, who has this huge conversion, you know, God can do anything. He can do mm-hmm. anything, but yeah, we need that, that little bit of humility And that is what is so sorely lacking right now in our culture, which is why this is such a rare, um, rare thing for, for couples to experience when there is abuse involved. So, um, wow. And I'm sure it's not, it's still not easy for you. I, there were many times when I just, I I said to the Lord, I said, you know, can't, can't I just get a divorce? You know, I just, I want to give up. This is, it would be easier to get a divorce, but I know, I knew in my heart that we were both healing, but it, it was a really painful journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's so easy just to want to give up and just be like, forget about it. I'm not, um, but in my instance, and again, it is rare. I don't want to, I don't want to put false hope in, in anyone's hearts. And I also don't want to, you know, abuse victims tend to be a pr- prisoners of hope. They just hope they'll, they'll stay in the marriage of hope, hope, change, hope to, and I don't ever recommend that. I mean, I know for myself, I left, I had to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't ever stay in a relationship out of hope because if someone is going to change, they're going to change whether, whether you stay or go most likely. Well, I guess it depends on the situation. I won't say that, but it's, it's not up to anyone else. It's up to them. Yeah. So, you know, don't stay out of hope, but if, if it does happen, if there is a true and authentic conversion, it takes years to know if it's authentic because of that abuse cycle. You have to be careful. 
like I said before, the first few months might seem great. Is it authentic? It might sound authentic because abusers are really, really good at manipulating their words. Yes. Their words mean nothing. So if anyone out there is in this situation where they think, I think my spouse really is changing. Beautiful. Pray about it. Keep on praying. Be wary. Don't listen to words. Words don't mean anything because any words can be spoken. It's the actions. Mm -hmm. It is the yes. action. I've heard, uh, ever, I know Dr. John Deloney has gotten really popular. He's, I think he's a part of the Ramsey network, but he's been doing, he's, he's been a psychologist and stuff for years, but he always says behavior is a language and you need to pay attention. And I love just that, that way of phrasing it. Behavior is a language. What is your, what is your spouse saying to you uh, when, when you're interacting with them? Because it's not about what they're verbalizing. It, it is about the behavior that is a language in and of itself. So um, I think that's really important. And that's, and that's really how you discern uh, mm -hmm. over a period of time, whether or not this is, this is moving in a good direction, or if it's just sort of like you're, someone's trying to pull the wool over your eyes over and over again. Um, really good. Really good. Do you have any, uh, final thoughts about, um, about how you can maybe where people can go to visit you and your work? I would love for people to connect with you. I know I had people reach out to me after our last interview, um, saying they wanted to connect with you because they thought them that they were maybe were in an abusive relationship or that they themselves were, uh, abusive. Um, and so I think it would be helpful if, if people knew where they can get help, maybe from you, but also other resources available to help Catholic couples, uh, find healing or, or yeah, get the help that they need. Sure. So I can be found very simply jennydubay.com. So that's the best way. There's a contact form, send me an email. I respond to all messages. Um, so that is the best way to get in touch with me. And I welcome all people. Just if, if you feel like you need to reach out, please do. Please do. And as far as like online healing, I really recommend Hope's Garden. Hopesgarden.com. It is, it's an online community for, their mission is just healing hearts, marriages, and families. And Hope's Garden is, an online Catholic community for women. So we have um, prayer groups. We meet for prayers. We meet over like Google Meet, um, prayer throughout the day. We have a Mighty Networks online forum where we can just talk. We have support groups. So I um, co-facilitate a domestic abuse support group. We meet twice a week. We also have betrayal trauma support groups, family, family of origin support, um, for family of origin traumas. And, and then it's not just for people who uh, have experienced domestic abuse. It's for anyone, any woman who wants to grow in the love of Christ, the divine bridegroom, and just the growing in Christ. And there's just so much support, so much love, so much beauty. It's an amazing community. For men out there, it's men of hope. And if, if they go to the Hope's Garden website, at the top, it says join our community. If you click the link, join our community, you'll see a link to both um, the Hope's Garden online community and the Men of Hope. So men can go to Men of Hope and join that. And I know for me, I, I've been with Hope's Garden for so many years and that's when my healing journey truly began. Hmm. It is an amazing, it's just getting that community support is so, so important. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And of course, I'm going to recommend everyone who uh, feels like um, maybe they're wondering if they're in an abusive marriage or relationship or know somebody that that might be definitely go get Jenny's book. I, I've got it right here for you. Um, don't plant your seeds among thorns. And uh, thank you so much for writing this for for people today so that more people have access to these resources and this knowledge you've just compiled it so well in this little guide um and i really want to thank you for that we need that more than ever yeah. thank you yeah it was it was an honor it's, it's i felt honored to 
had the opportunity to write it and for En Route Books and Media to publish it because it just, in the Catholic world, I just felt like it was needed. It's needed information. So. It is very much so. So thank you so much for doing that. And for everyone listening, please check the, the description. If you, if you're wondering where to get it, it's going to be there and, uh, and go back and listen to our last interview for more information and insight on domestic violence. It was one of probably one of my most watched interviews actually over the years. So thank you so much. And until next time, God bless all of you.